Good evening and welcome. I'm Heather Campion, the CEO of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you along with my colleagues here at the Kennedy Library, including Tom Putnam, the director. This library and museum is a national treasure. It's one of only 13 presidential libraries in America, and it's the place where we all like to say President Kennedy's legacy comes alive. As I'm sure you noticed when you arrived, we're currently undergoing a bit of construction. We're updating our museum with new technologies that will improve our sound systems, including new interactive displays, which we've not had before, and we'll be enhancing all of the film footage that we show in the museums. So visitors will get to experience President Kennedy and his iconic words, his most famous speeches and debates in a more powerful and engaging way. So we hope you'll come back to be reintroduced to this extraordinary museum when we reopen at the end of March. The JFK Library forums are free and open to the public, both in this room and on the Kennedy Library website, as they are now all being live streamed. And this is thanks to generous support from our lead sponsor, Bank of America, the Boston Foundation, the Lowell Institute, Raytheon, Viacom, and our media partners, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. I see Charlie Kravitz here tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from two distinguished American journalists about health care, an issue that President Kennedy was deeply involved with in the spring of 1962 when he launched an effort to provide health care for the elderly and put into motion the creation of what we now know as Medicare. This effort culminated in a nationally televised presidential address from Madison Square Garden where President Kennedy said, and I quote, I refuse to see this country shrink from these struggles which are our responsibility because what we're now talking about in our children's day will seem to be the ordinary business of government. Well, despite his compelling words and efforts to introduce health care for America's senior citizens, President Kennedy's proposed legislation foundered amidst charges that it was an attempt to socialize medicine and a threat to individual liberty. We have a brief video clip of his being asked this very question question at a press conference, and we thought you'd enjoy hearing his response. Yes, uh, Mr. President, uh, the critics of your medical care plan have uh, charged that this will be the opening wedge for socialized medicine in this country. Would you care to comment on that, sir? Well, it's an old argument when a case is lost to uh, argue that uh, it's all right here, but what's it going to mean for the future? Uh, under that argument, uh, there wouldn't have been any progress uh, on any uh, social legislation in this country. That was the argument that was used against the Social Security Act in the 30s. It's the argument used against the minimum wage. It's the argument used against any agricultural program. It is the oldest argument uh, in the world. The fact of the matter is, this is a useful program. It is uh, developed for a special purpose. And in my judgment, uh, it's going to be adopted. I believe it has a good chance this year, if not in the future, and it's in the economic as well as the social interest of the people of our country. But to say I'm against this because in a future date somebody else may do something uh, doesn't seem to me to be a, a, a rational argument, and with the kind of argument which was successfully defeated on many occasions during the administration of Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. So, here we are 50 years later with Medicare having been passed by President Johnson and the Affordable Care Act having been passed by President Obama, both monumental achievements that affect every American and continues to inspire passionate discussion and debate about both our government and our healthcare industry. Tonight, we're honored to have a journalist, an award-winning author, and an entrepreneur all in one person who has contributed mightily to our national debate on this topic, Stephen Brell. His new book entitled, America's Bitter Pill, right here, Money, Politics, Backroom Deals, and the Fight to Fix Our Broken Healthcare System. It was just released this month and is already receiving attention 
everywhere. The first week, it was featured on the cover of the New York Times Book Review, last week, the cover of Time Magazine, and most importantly, this week, it's on the homepage of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library website. <laughs> and you can find signed copies of the book on sale here in our museum store after the forum. This book already also has an impressive list of accolades. Ariana Huffington calls it a gripping narrative. Tom Brokaw says, it's what every American should read before stepping into a doctor's office or a hospital. And Walter Isaacson has deemed it one of the most important books of our time. Stephen Brill has a varied and impactful career, having been a feature writer for The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and Time. He has also founded and run several news organizations, including Court TV, The American Lawyer Magazine, and 10 regional legal newspapers. He teaches journalism at Yale, where he also founded the Yale Journalism Initiative to encourage young people to become journalists. Thank you for bringing your important work and thinking to this forum tonight. And finally, our moderator this evening is the remarkable and talented news correspondent, Susan Spencer. Susan is a correspondent for CBS News' 48 Hours, where she has reported on both national and international issues ranging from Bosnian refugees to the issues with aut autism. A much admired and talented journalist, Susan has received two Emmy Awards, an Environmental Defense Fund Award, and the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence. Prior to joining 48 Hours, she was the CBS News White House correspondent and the primary correspondent for the Eye on America segments of the evening news. She has covered both Democratic and Republican national conventions, presidential campaigns, and inaugurations. And fittingly for tonight's discussion, she previously served as CBS News's medical correspondent. She's one of the most optimistic, ever energetic, and interested journalists I know. Just to give you a glimpse of her tenacity and zest for adventure, I just learned that in the same year that she became eligible for Medicare, she took up unicycling. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that she, too, has a special connection to Boston, actually to this very neighborhood in Dorchester, which is her husband, Tom Oliphant, who's covering his face in the front row here as I embarrass him, a long time nationally recognized journalist who was a Boston Globe columnist and their Washington correspondent for many years. Tom is here not only for today's forum, but because he's spending time right now in our archives doing research for a new book on JFK. Please join me in welcoming two extraordinary journalists, Stephen Brill and Susan Spencer, to the John F. Kennedy Library Forum. swoop, she destroyed my entire credibility. <laughs> you will not be able to think of anything but the silly unicycle. Um, thank you for coming. I'm looking forward Thanks to having, having a chat. As, as I understand the format, we chat for a while and then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, before we get to the book, which is truly a remarkable achievement, I second what everyone else is saying about it. It's a good read, which is not what you expect from a book like this. Um, but I was struck by, in listening to President Kennedy, Nothing is new, right? I mean, these are the same complaints we heard in a general way about Obamacare. Right, but remember what he's defending there. What he's defending is the outrageous idea that people 65 years old and older should have government health insurance. For Finn. I mean, imagine <laughs> that. Now, the reason the country was put in that spot, actually, was that uh, uh, there's an interesting history here. In 1943, the, uh, a board called the War Labor Board, which President Roosevelt had organized to enforce wage and price controls during the war, had a meeting and they had to consider something that they hadn't thought about much, which was employers were starting to give their employees this thing called health insurance. This was as a job incentive, As right? a job incentive because uh, they weren't allowed to, uh, to do anything with their wages. You know, wages were frozen. So they figured, well, the way we'll get around this is we'll give them this thing called health insurance. And health care was starting to become relevant um, 
because some drugs had been developed and penicillin was out there. So people were actually starting to spend money on healthcare in ways they hadn't before. But they're no doubt thinking, well, this is no big deal, right? Well, we'll just give them health insurance. It's not a big deal because at that time, healthcare spending was all of maybe 4% of the gross domestic product. It's now 18 to 20%. So this little thing, this little extra benefit. And the War Labor Board, um, in a decision where I have been unable to find a single news clip about it, totally unnoticed, says, okay, that's okay, you can do that, big deal. Then the IRS decides, well, since uh, the War Labor Board says this isn't a wage increase, it's not taxable. So that makes it an even better benefit. It's a tax-free benefit. Why does this matter? Because beginning then, employers by the droves started offering health insurance, and equally important, unions started negotiating that as a benefits package. So when Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman uh, you know, start to look around and see that every other country in the world is now starting to give their people national health insurance, uh, Roosevelt and his staff toyed with the idea of putting national health insurance in as part of the New Deal. Guess who was against it? The unions, the progressive unions, because they said, don't do that. This is something that's in our tool bag for recruiting members. We want them you know, to appreciate that we're getting this in their contracts. So, so Medicare has to wait. So that removed a constituency who otherwise, as in every other country, would have wanted government health care, meaning anyone who had a job where the employer was providing health insurance. That's what set this country, unlike any other country, off on a path where health insurance became associated with uh, your job. So if you take all the people who have jobs and take them out of the, out of, of the political uh, constituency for health care, who are you left with who really needs it? People who had retired from jobs. And because they're old, they're going to get sick. So the most obvious place to go with reform was something uh, that President Truman tried to do and the American Medical Association, which then had a lot of power, now it has no power. Um, you know, the medical device makers in Massachusetts have more power than the doctors. Um, so uh, Truman wasn't able to do it because the AMA opposed it. The AMA called it socialized medicine. Um, and that stuck. And President Kennedy tried and couldn't do it. Uh, the only thing that really did it was Barry Goldwater, because that caused such a Democratic landslide in 1964 that when President Johnson was elected in 64, he had the majorities mm -hmm. uh, to do this. How would you summarize, though, what President Kennedy's contribution to that was? Since, as you say, he tried very hard to get what we now call Medicare through the Senate, and it didn't work. His contribution was, uh, frankly, the same as uh, President Truman's contribution, which was just keeping the idea out there and helping to build up the constituency for it. Um, now, what became Obamacare, I should add, uh, that is a more conservative health care reform plan than President Nixon proposed in the 1970s when he was trying to head off a much more ambitious progressive health reform plan pushed by Senator Ted Kennedy. You know, I remember the day that Obamacare passed. I had two sensations. I felt, first of all, astonished. I really was astonished that this had passed, knowing you know, how long this had been kicking around in one form or another. And I also felt a little proud that my country had done this. Uh, was I justified in either of those feelings? Yeah. <laughs> um, but then when you really sort of stop and yeah. think about it, and if you know, get obsessed and spend a year and a half or two years writing a book about it, it becomes less surprising. Right. Because what you realize is that the reason it passed, is that was my, my microphone still working? Yeah, you're fine. Oh, good. Uh, the reason it passed was because in today's Washington, what gets through under the label of reform is what the big business interests in that industry, in the healthcare industry, want to get passed. So if I say to you, my idea for healthcare reform is yes, let's give tens of millions of people who don't have access to healthcare which is you know, a national disgrace that John Kennedy was talking about and Ted Kennedy is, is the hero of talking right. about. Um, uh, let's give 
10 to 20, 30 million people access to health care they don't have because we want to stop being the only developed country in the world where most of the citizens don't have access to health care. That's the good news. That sounds like Let's a great idea. Yeah. But the way we're going to get it done in Washington is if we make deals with uh, the pharmaceutical industry that promise them we're not going to do anything about the ridiculously high prices you charge. We're just going to give you a lot more new customers who are going to be uh, subsidized by the government because when they go on the insurance exchanges to buy health insurance, they're going to get a subsidy to buy it. And, we, and we're going to add more people who are poor to uh, the Medicaid rolls, which I think is a great thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, we're not going to do anything to interfere with the prices you charge. And we're not going to do anything to interfere with the prices that these so-called nonprofit hospitals charge. Um, so you're creating just more customers for the people who are getting rich off of health care in the first place. So your basic, That's reform. Your, your basic thesis here is that, yes, Obamacare is great news it's in terms great of thing, expanding coverage. It's a great thing that the president did. He deserves credit for it for a lot of reasons. One, for sticking to it when even that kind of reform was opposed so rabidly by the Republicans, and he stuck to it through the what's called the Tea Party summer and all that stuff. He stuck to it. Deserves great credit for that and deserves great credit for taking ownership, which is really what he's done, of a really lousy health care system. So that every time anyone in this audience you know, gets a memo or has a meeting with the HR department where they work, and the HR person sits down and says, you know, this year uh, we're going to have to raise the deductibles on your policy. We're going to have to raise the co-insurance. We're going to have to raise the copay, And you know, the copay on what you pay for drugs is going up. Uh, unfortunately, we have to do it because of Obamacare has nothing to do with Obamacare. They've been doing that for 15 years. They've been having those meetings because the prices keep going up. But so, the president is now blamed for everything having to do with health care. And he deserves a lot of credit for taking that on. He doesn't deserve much credit for implementing the law and for doing the nuts and bolts of governing. But that's another story. But as far as costs go, which everybody acknowledges are insane. Right. Um, why was he not able to do both of these because things? Because well, be, it's pretty simple if you think about it. If you cut health care costs, you're cutting the incomes of a lot of industries. Okay, so the pharmaceutical industry has a, a lobby that lobbies, uh, you know, Democrats as well as Republicans. Uh, well, actually, let's take a present example of what I'm talking about. One of the supposedly bipartisan ideas emerging, a little teeny weeny idea about how to fix Obamacare, is let's repeal the medical device tax. The medical device tax is, ta is a tax that was enacted under Obamacare of 3% to cover, um, it's an excise tax on the sale of things like uh, you know, pacemakers, artificial knees, artificial hips, defibrillators, wheelchairs, and the rationale was, well, we're creating all these new customers for all these medical device makers. Um, uh, let's make them pay something for it. So this is a 3% tax. There is a bipartisan move afoot to repeal this awful job-killing, uh, profit-killing tax. You know, Elizabeth Warren favors repealing it. Al Franken favors repealing it. The two states where there are most uh, with the medical device industry is heaviest, or I guess which. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and, and of course, the Republicans mm -hmm. want, to uh, want to repeal it. And everybody says it's a job killer and it's a profits killer. Uh, uh, Medtronic, which is one of the leading device makers. The, Minnesota, right? Uh, yeah, Minnesota. Yeah. Al Franken and A.B. Klobuchar mm -hmm. think they're just, they're suffering from this device tax. Um, and by the way, the profit margins of Medtronic are almost double the profit margins of Apple, which is considered a pretty successful company, uh, and makes complicated, manufactures complicated equipment, um, almost double. So what's happened since Obamacare passed? Um, Medtronic's profit is up 67%, and they've added more than 5,000 people to their payroll. What a job killer that <laughs> tax was. Um, it's, uh, so that's what happens. I mean, I know I 
sound a little cynical about this, but that's what happens in Washington. So when you have health care reform, um, what you get is um, nothing to allow uh, people in Massachusetts to buy drugs in Canada by mail order online. Which well, that was something that the drug, the, the drug folks they were made a deal completely with, crazy about. They made it. a deal with the White House and uh, the Democrats in the Senate, uh, the pharmaceutical company. And they talked to me on the record about this in the book. And there are emails I have in the book where they just spell this out in detail. If you don't mess around with you know, drug importation from Canada, if you promise not to do anything to repeal the law that says that Medicare, the largest healthcare consumer on the planet, can't negotiate the price of drugs, just has to pay what the drug companies charge. Um, if you don't mess around with that, if you don't mess around with a couple other things that these pesky Democrats have been talking about for a while, um, we'll support it. Why not? Sounds like great reform. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that's what happened. They Same did give with, back, if you will. They gave a, back, uh, as I explained in the book, about $90 billion over 10 years in um, the following. Um, uh, slight decreases in, uh, or slight increases in the discount they have to give to Medicaid for drugs, um, a revenue, a sales tax, and in fact an excise tax on their revenues, but they gave back 90 billion. Their own stock analysts, you know, these are public companies, and when they're talking to Wall Street, they want to brag about how good things are, not how bad things are. So when they're on uh, conference calls with stock analysts, they're talking about, oh, this Obamacare thing, this is going to be great. I mean, this is terrific and for indeed us. indeed it has been. And it has been. So uh, they got about $300 billion worth of new customers, depending on how you count that, in return wow. for giving back $80 billion and, most important, dodging all those real bullets, such as uh, you know, giving Medicare the ability to negotiate. Mm -hmm. uh, the hospitals, same kind of thing. So we have the device companies, they're big winners. Yeah. We have the drug companies, they're big winners under Obamacare. Everybody, yeah. The insurance the companies hospitals. are certainly big winners because the health insurance is basically a dying industry. Um, so they revived the, what's called the individual market and created all these customers. So you go online and you, you know, you're 62 years old and uh, you're a family of two, your kids have left the house and you make $64,000 a year in Florida, uh, your health insurance might cost nine thousand, uh, might cost nine hundred dollars a month, but get us what? Because you make sixty-four thousand dollars a year and not sixty-five thousand dollars a year, you're within four hundred percent of the poverty line, which is where the cutoff is. And of that nine hundred dollars a month, the government pays five or six hundred dollars of it. So, the government has just created this great new customer for Aetna or United Healthcare or whoever it is. Uh, with our tax dollars paying it, but it's still a low margin business. The health insurance business is, is just a terrible business. So the situation you described then, we have millions and millions more people with health insurance paying the same ridiculous prices that we were paying before we, these people had health insurance. That's right. Yeah. That's oh, right. good. That's, we just added <laughs> new customers to, a, uh, to um, an abusive marketplace, uh, and, and the taxpayers are paying much of the bill. 87% of the people who go to the health insurance exchanges to buy their health insurance get a subsidy mm -hmm. from the federal government. And obviously, 100% of the people who get added uh, to Medicaid are getting a subsidy. So now, the, the it used to be the, the Democrats used to be proud of that, would yeah. be proud of something like that. Um, the, the Obamacare is a, is a bigger redis income redistribution program that helps more poor and middle class people than the welfare program that Ronald Reagan ran against in 1980. And the welfare program that Bill Clinton, with so much you know, celebration, reformed in, what was it, 1998 or six, whenever it was. It's more people. And the president never articulated that. And I think it's because the Democrats um, were just afraid. They're just spooked to say, we're actually doing something for poor and lower middle class people. Um, I said earlier that this book is a good read. And what makes it a good read, I think, is that it is filled with really jaw-dropping little tidbits along the way. <laughs> My favorite of which is that we, in this country, we actually spend more treating back pain 
than we spend on state, county, yeah, and I, local I spent, police. I spent, yeah, my, <laughs> my wife thought I was crazy. I, I spent like five hours one day at my dining room table online trying to find out what we spent on. It's, it's like a hard it's figure to find out. Here's, here's the equation. We spend approximately $85 billion a year on, uh, on back pain. That's a B, billion. B, you know, $85 billion a year on back pain. <laughs> Um, if you add up the spending on every state, city, town, county uh, police force, it's slightly less than that. Wow. Um, but the worst thing is that if you ask doctors who know, I don't know if, I don't know if there are any doctors in the audience, but I'm um, in fact a doctor um, at Partners at Mass General was the one who sort of put me onto this in the first place. They will tell you that half, if not more, of what we spend on lower back pain is totally wasted money. It's people selling surgery or you know, neurostimulators or elaborate uh, uh, treatments when if you went to a chiropractor or a physical therapist or in fact if you just did nothing but rest, it, it would go away. I mean, half. So. That's a big number. It's even worse. So there you are at your dining room table, and you're. I getting get that number, Eureka. You know, and then I find Eureka. out that, yeah. that we spend more on um, artificial knees and hips than Hollywood takes in at the box office in a given year. <laughs> these who things knew, are everywhere. Right? Yeah, who yeah. knew? <laughs> uh, but there you are at your dining room yeah. table, unearthing all these amazing facts. Um, and you're presumably getting more and more depressed about the state of America's health care, and along comes April. Well, I'm getting excited about the book, though. You get excited about the book, but you're, not, you're probably not finding out much that's yeah. very encouraging yeah. about the health care system. Right. And there you are, and it's now April 2014, and suddenly you find yourself in a situation where you go from intrepid investigative, you know, hard-nosed journalist to patient. Yeah. Um, uh, tell uh, everybody what happened. Uh, you, you talk about. On, on, on the last day of, of, of Obamacare, of, of enrollments in the exchanges, which I was like tracking and obsessed by because this was you know, the story of my book, um, I had um, gotten a few days before, because my wife had been nagging me to, to get a, um, a checkup, my very careful uh, cardiologist, who's also our GP, um, had taken my pulse on one side and on another side, and something seemed strange, and he had me, asked me to go get a test, and I'm figuring, you know, I'm the guy writing about all these useless tests and the price and everything, you know. And I just, and I just is he doing this to me too? And, and I get one test, and then he says, you need an MRI, and I said, oh, God, that's like, a, I've hit the jackpot of, of useless <laughs> <Wasteful> tests. tests. <laughs> and I get this MRI, and I remember it's in the morning, and, and the guy who gave it to me, um, sort of knew me from the Time Magazine article and we were talking. And then I got on a plane to go to San Francisco and I was coming back the next day. And the doctor calls me, my doctor calls me and says, you need open heart surgery. You have an aortic aneurysm. And my wife and I go wow. to see him the next day. And to, I said, I can't, you know, there's nothing wrong with me. I've, I've worked out today. <laughs> and he said, well, did you lift weights? I said, I lifted something. He says, yeah, you gotta stop with the weights until we talk. <laughs> um, so, we go see him. I mean, this, is, this is no messing around stuff. This oh, is no, a, this is, no, this well, here's be. what he says. He says, okay, you, the size of your aneurysm, I forget what it was, but at that size, you have a 17% chance every year that it'll burst. Mm -hmm. And if it bursts, you do not even get to the emergency room. You just die. That's it. Um, so I said, well, how many people continue the conversation after that? <laughs> and he said, well, you'd be surprised. Some guy says, well, I got this thing I've got to do in Europe next week. I said, no, no. We, I'm so, busy. So, so two or three days later, I'm in the hospital, um, and I'm a patient. And, and I first, you know, intellectually, I knew this was a serious thing, but as we're going into the hospital, the first thing you do is you meet, you know, when you're having surgery, you get to meet the anesthesiologist. Well, I sense trouble when three of them showed up to <laughs> meet with me. Um, you know, we're your anesthesiology team. I said, oh, great. Why do, you, why do we need three of you? Well, we, you know, we stop your heart, and we, you know, we pump blood or whatever is air to your brain and to your lungs. And then I just went weak at the I mean, I said, you stopped my heart. And he said, 
well, what do you think happens when you have open heart surgery? Can you keep your heart going? And I said, yeah, I guess that's right. But I didn't realize it. Well, so you're was, amazingly <laughs> candid about Oh, God, I was an idiot. You said you turned into a puddle. No, I, I mean, yeah. you don't look like a puddle. I uh, was a puddle. So that <laughs> night, that night I'm lying in the hospital. I'm about to have surgery the next day. You're the tough journalist. You yeah, know right. all about this stuff. <laughs> and my part is pan. I'm, I am completely terrified. And I finally fall asleep, and I have this dream. And in the dream, the... Um, the CEO of the hospital, who of course, me being me, I knew his salary, I knew how, how overpaid he was. Uh, uh, you know, the CEO of the hospital, who I hadn't met, I mean, I've now met a lot. The CEO of the hospital, as they're, they're wheeling me into the operating room, the CEO puts his hand up, he's got a perfectly tailored suit, because after all, he makes $3.58 million a year. So why wouldn't he have a tailored suit? Puts his hand up and said, stop. And the orderlies of the nurses stop. They're kind of nervous. They've never seen the, this guy in the near the operating room like this, even though he actually is a cardiac surgeon, as it turns out. He said, we know who you are, we know what you're doing, and you're not doing it. You're trying to get some kind of undercover story on us. It's not going to work. This is a dream. Now, I, I will tell you without naming names that one television interviewer this week was about to go on the air. We were sitting here, and the camera was about to go on, and he turns to me and says, the CEO of the hospital really stopped you? It wouldn't let you get the surgery? <laughs> Oops. Because it, it's in like the first five pages of the book, which is what he But he didn't read the part where it was a dream. Anyway, <laughs> so, what, so I, I stopped him from doing it. So in the dream, I say, well, no, I, I swear to God, I really need this. I mean, my doctor says this is you know, 17%, blah, blah, blah. And I said, listen, I don't care about your charge master. The charge master is this ridiculous price list that I'd written about that every hospital has where they charge you, for example, $77 for a box of gauze pads if you can decode it and figure it out. You know, trust me, Partners does that. Not that I have seen a Partners bill that does that, but just trust me. Um, <laughs> and if they don't do that, they charge you $25 uh, for a uh, mucus uh, suppression system, better known as a tissue. All, all this stuff. <laughs> So all, all this stuff is on hospitals, and I'd written about this in time. It's called the charge master. So I say to him from the gurney in the dream, I don't care. I'll take six of your charge masters. I, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to write about it. And I'll buy 100 boxes of your gauze pads for $77 <laughs> each. Just let me in your operating room. But this is reflecting how you but were feeling, really. But it reflects a really, reality, right? too. But, but the reason it's actually a serious point is it reflects the reality of health care which is that you, you can't be a consumer when you're in that situation or anything close to that situation. You'll do anything. You are scared. You, I mean, I was about to be, after the operation, in a lot of pain, and I would have paid anything for a cough suppressant to keep me from cough. But you're not a consumer. It's not like you know, you're going out to buy a smartphone, and you wake up in the morning and say, well, I'll go to you know, Verizon, and I'll go here, and I'll go there, and I'll compare everything, and I'll decide what to buy. You don't wake up some morning and say, I think I'll wander down to the emergency room and you know, see what they have on sale. <laughs> if I don't like it, I'll go across the street to the other emergency room. Because you don't know what you need. You but what no about idea this had you not appreciated before? I mean, you well, obviously I appreciated knew. it intellectually. Yeah, you should but must you have do really. not. But there is a difference between appreciating it intellectually and you know, writing, you know, typing out words on a piece of paper saying that you know, the healthcare marketplace doesn't work. Um, and people, you know, and, and we need regulation because people cannot be consumers the way they are elsewhere. I was on a TV show uh, with George Will after the Time Magazine piece came out, and, and George says, well, you know, the problem is people just don't have any skin in the game. Well, uh, first of all, I had written about people in the Time Magazine article and in this book who didn't have insurance, so, you know, there's a guy who gets stopped at MD Anderson from getting his first cancer treatment until his wife can cough up $84,000 in advance for his first treatment and his first transfusion. He had 100% skin in the game. Didn't do him any good, didn't have the money. Um, but the idea that, you know, that if I had skin in the game, I would be a better consumer of healthcare is ridiculous. So how does this affect the debate then, if, if this fear factor is always there? It, well, it's what different. we saw with Obamacare, what, what we just saw with, with, you know, uh, with uh, the question to President Kennedy is 
healthcare lends itself to fear tactics on both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, just step back and think about this. Obamacare, whatever its faults for not reforming, um, Obamacare is not what the Republicans said it was. The Republicans said it was a government takeover of healthcare. Um, a group called Generation Opportunity that uh, was funded by uh, the Koch brothers did these, this viral video of Uncle Sam coming out from between a woman's legs in the doctor's office of you know, government getting between the doctor and the patient. Obamacare is not a government takeover of healthcare. It's exactly the opposite. It's the government coughing up all this money so that the same private providers of healthcare can keep providing it with no regulation on their prices. They just get a lot of money from the government to do it. It's a Republican's dream, which in fact is why it, Obamacare is a slightly more conservative version in many respects of what Richard Nixon proposed in the 1970s to head off a progressive reform proposal proposed by Ted Kennedy. And it is a much more conservative version of Romneycare. So how were the Republicans able to do that? With, with, with scare tactics because people don't think clearly about their healthcare system, and they don't understand anything about it. I mean, nobody understands how it works. I'm sure you're gonna ask me, so I'll, so I'll run over <laughs> your line. I was just gonna say you do. About, well, I don't, um, about you know, this other sort of my favorite moment in the book is after I get out of the hospital, um, I'm home and I'm, you know, I'm supposed to rest for a week or two, actually for three or four, and um, there arrives in the mail this wonderful, delightful package, at least for me it was, of uh, 36 different first class envelopes from United Healthcare. 36 different explanations of benefits. First of all, the fact that it's in 36 different envelopes gives you some window onto the efficiency of the system. Um, <laughs> but I'm thrilled, I mean, I, you know, I got nothing to do and, and I'm supposed to be an expert on this stuff and I'm ready to dive into my 36 different explanations of benefits and decode them you know, you all know that these things are impossible to read. So the third or fourth one I open says, um, <coughs> amount Excuse billed, me. amount billed, zero. <coughs> amount paid by insurance company, zero. Amount you owe, $152.40. <laughs> so I read it, and I try to decode it, I can't figure it out, I give it to my wife, who's you know, a lot smarter than I am, and is actually a real lawyer. Um, and she looks at it and she can't figure it out either. Uh, well, it turns out that I had scheduled for two or three weeks later when I was able to travel, before I'd gone to the hospital, I had scheduled an interview with the CEO of United Healthcare uh, in <coughs> Minneapolis to talk about you know, all the stuff in the book about Obamacare and insurance industry lobbying and what's the future of the insurance industry and are they gonna buy hospitals the way I think hospitals are gonna buy insurance companies. All this stuff, we have a very good conversation, very smart, good guy. Um, and then at the end, uh, I'm sitting across his conference room table in his office. At the end, I say, I wonder if you could help me with something. <coughs> I got this explanation of benefits, and I, I don't understand it, and I hand him my explanation of benefits. And it's everyone every, wants to be able to Wouldn't you all this? love to ask the CEO yeah. of your health insurance company? You figure you know. it out. Right? This is why you and I have great jobs, <laughs> yeah. right? So um, I hand it to him, he looks at it, he looks at it. his uh, executive vice president for, for public affairs. You know, United Healthcare is a $80, 100000000000 billion company. This is a big deal that he's doing an interview. His executive vice president for public affairs, I can see is thinking about what his next job is gonna be um, uh, for allowing this person into the room with this thing. So he looks at it and he looks up and says, I could sit here all day and I could not decode that for you. I have no idea what it means. I have no idea why they sent it to you. And I said, aren't you they? <laughs> <coughs> but think about what, we've, what we're talking about here. This is, the, we think of ourselves as the greatest free market economy in the world, which we are. It is the largest sector in the greatest free market consumer economy in the world. Um, the most frequent common communication to consumers in that sector of the economy is 
the explanation of benefits, right? That's what we all think of when we think of health insurance and how confusing it is. The CEO of the largest, most successful company in the country who sends out tens of billions of those things every month, he doesn't know what it means. So why are we supposed to know what it means? I always um, thought it was intentional. I mean, it, it's so bad that it's hard to imagine that this is not, you know, I always it felt- It could be. I mean, I, in fact, when he sort of recovered from the first statement, he said, well, I think it's the, uh, the New York State regulations that require us to send it to you with that language. So I said <laughs> to his barely breathing public relations person, I said, you know, when you guys have a chance, could you just send me a copy of those regs so I can look at them? And, and they send me the, the, what I knew were the New York State regs, with, and the only thing relevant to explanations of benefits in the New York State insurance regs was obviously, no surprise, these shall be uh, delivered and communicated in a clear and concise manner so that a lay person can understand it. And that, obviously, that's what it's going to say. So, but that, I think, is emblematic of uh, the system we're dealing with. And, you know, and Obamacare really does nothing to nothing change, to change that. And, and nor could it. Um, I think, you know, the political reality is, and this is why, uh, you know, Ted Kennedy supported Romney Care in Massachusetts and supported Obamacare. I mean, you know, the, uh, you know, health reform became the cause of his life mm -hmm. at the end of his life, actually for most of his life. I mean, what Ted Kennedy had, um, he's probably the sort of the most unambiguous hero in the whole book, actually. Um, what he had was a gift of empathy that was amazing. Um, it, it, part of it was when he was in the hospital with his son who had cancer. Right, he'd experienced an awful lot of he that. Would, he didn't experience, obviously, uh, the financial pressure. Right. But he did experience because he would, uh, for a while they were in a situation, uh, Vicki Kennedy told me all this, that um, where they were trying these experimental uh, drugs on uh, some of the people who uh, were with his son and his son. And the parents were terrified because if the experimental drug worked, the insurance company, in, in one case, had taken a position that you could only get 12 weeks worth of it and they needed 34 weeks and it just made him crazy, made those parents crazy too. But so he saw that stuff through a lot of his life and um, understood the problems of you know, care for the elderly. Uh, where were they gonna you know, end up if they, you know, at the end of life or near the end of life when they needed hospice care or nursing home care. There was a provision in Obamacare that he tried to get in um, and he got sort of a halfway version of it in and then it had to be scrapped because it was too expensive. But um, he, was the, he was the guy on this stuff. But he understood that the compromise was going to be that uh, the lobbyists would support it. It wasn't going to be a situation um, as had happened uh, with Hillary Clinton, where um, the drug industry, I think it was the drug industry, maybe it was the insurance industry, maybe it was both, ran those Harry and Louise ads mm -hmm. that just killed healthcare reform in its tracks. Mm -hmm. But is it fair to view this, though, at least as a start? I mean, Medicare wasn't what it is today when it first started. Social Security it's a start, has, it's a has had improvements and changes over the years. We, you're not giving up on this. Well, the, the, this needs to be divided in two parts. It, it is the, you know, health reform just writ large um, is about two things, has been about two things, access to care, mm -hmm. um, which again, in this country is not something we take for granted, and the cost. Um, what uh, the people who framed and pushed uh, Romney Care in Massachusetts were, were quite candid about in talking to me for the book, and they were actually candid about it at the time, was, all right, uh, it's politically impossible to do costs. The, the industry's never gonna let us screw around with costs. Uh, let's do coverage. Because if we get when, enough people involved. And when more people get coverage, it'll become so expensive that they'll have to do something about <laughs> cost. Well, how's that working out here <laughs> so far? Um, but that's sort of the, the pot. So the same thing tacitly happened at uh, the White House and on Capitol Hill, although President Obama kept saying um, you know, there was a fight in his administration, mm -hmm. as I recount in the book, where the economics team kept saying, you know, you got to do costs. And 
this is, uh, you know, it's crucial that you do cost because it's, it's in fact part of what's necessary for the economic recovery. And the policy team said you got to do coverage. And uh, the policy team said if you do cost, you're never going to get anything through Capitol Hill. And the economics team said, oh, yes, we can. We can do some of it. You know, Larry Summers was on the warpath about doing a lot of it. Um, and the president and Valerie Jarrett, who is by a lot of accounts in the book, the actual chief of staff, um, said yes, meaning yes, let's do both. They wouldn't make a choice, but the tacit choice became from what, you know, when the sausage was finished being made on Capitol Hill, the tacit, the, the, the choice was we're gonna do coverage and we'll sort of nip it, um, mm -hmm costs sort of are around the edges. We'll have some experiments, we'll encourage accountable care organizations, we'll encourage this, we'll penalize hospitals in Medicare payments if they readmit patients, if they have high rates of readmitting patients within 30 days, that's a good thing. But the basic, the basics of cost, of cost reform, drug companies, device makers, hospitals, uh, nothing. Nothing. Nor was there, and uh, on the other side of the aisle, was there anything done about you know, sensible tort reform? And that's because, as we all know, the trial lawyer is on the Democratic Party. Um, and the, the consequence of that is not so much high malpractice rates or anything. I think the real consequence of that is um, if you go to any emergency room in the country and you just use the word head, as in, I have a headache, I fell on my head, or I have to head to the men's room. Um, <laughs> you are getting a CAT scan. You are getting, you, in fact, you may get two of them. Now, the hospitals will either say that's, the, the reason for that is we're worried about a frivolous lawsuit if something goes wrong. We want to be able to demonstrate you know, belt and suspenders approach, or they're using that as an excuse. Either way, uh, we use those tests three or four times more per capita in the United States than any country in the world with no better healthcare results. And we also, the price of each test is two or three times what it is in every other country. So, uh, so tort reform is a piece of this. Um, and it's emblematic of yet another special interest that um, you know, got its way. Um, and they, they, they were like little tiny pilot projects inserted somewhere, but it turns out the Department of Health and Human Services never did them. Let me get you to go back while we're on costs and hospitals. Um, you mentioned in passing this phrase, charge master. I don't mm -hmm. think most people have ever heard of that. I know, I should. In the book, you refer to it as the, what, the eccentric old uncle in the attic or something. Nobody in the hospital wants to talk about this thing. This is essentially a price list, right? It's about a 10,000 or 15,000 or 30,000 item price list for and every, every hospital has everything its own. from, you know, mucus control devices, I, a I tissue, love that. <laughs> um, to uh, the, uh, a lot of hospitals do this. I mean, a, a hospital, you know, ironically named uh, Sisters of Mercy in Oklahoma, um, charges for the cuff that's used to take your blood pressure, as if they never use it again, right? It's over, put the cuff on. They charge charges for a, a light bulb, right? Didn't charge you? for the light bulb and the surgery, they just charge for everything. And, <laughs> and no one can explain it. No one will take responsibility for it. <clears throat> and if you ask the people who run the great hospitals in this city, they will tell you it's totally stupid, we shouldn't do it but everybody else does it, so we do it. And nobody pays it, right? And nobody pays it. Well, first of all, people who don't have insurance pay it because it's the list price. And second, uh, the more market power the hospital has, the more you come close to paying it. What I mean by that is it's sort of like the list price. It's sort of the sticker price when you go to buy a car. That's what the charge master is. So um, in my case, for example, I had these crazy charge master charges, but uh, some guy, uh, uh, there was a charge for $351 for a guy who, uh, who came in after my surgery and suggested I start walking down the hall, uh, which I had started doing. Uh, that was $351 in patient education. Uh, <laughs> and all kinds Otherwise of things you like might that. still be lying Otherwise there. Otherwise I might still be <laughs> lying there. Um, but every, so, but 
So my bill's $190,000, and, and, and I say, oh, well, this is the charger, so I can't wait to see what mincemeat United Healthcare made of this. United Healthcare got a 12% discount. And the reason is that really great branded, high quality, to their credit, hospitals, um, are such that they know that you can't sell health insurance on Manhattan Island if New York Presbyterian's not there. Now, once upon a time, you might have been able to do it because New York Hospital was one hospital and Columbia Presbyterian was another. Now they've merged and they've bought up all these other hospitals and they've bought up all these clinics. You want to sell health insurance in New York, they better be in your network, and they know it. So one of the strange things about Obamacare is, you know, politically they started calling it insurance reform when the reform started running into trouble because the president's, um, uh, the political people, the pollsters said people like insurance reform. They hate their insurance companies. They love their doctors. They like hospitals. They hate insurance companies, which is true. So it was all about insurance reform. But if anyone thinks the, the way to keep healthcare costs down in a place like Boston, or well, let's take New Haven, Connecticut, easier to, easier to explain. Yale New Haven Hospital owns just about everything in and around New Haven, Connecticut. So if you think the way to uh, lower healthcare costs for consumers in New Haven is to have seven insurance companies uh, competing instead of two or three, you got to explain that to me because the real issue there is who has the most leverage, the insurance company which is paying the price or Yale New Haven which is selling uh, the service. If Yale New Haven can play off seven insurance companies against each other, they can say, hey, you four, you're not in our network, we don't care about you, you go away. You three, we'll select you, uh, you three insurance companies, because you're gonna pay us 95% of the charge master. Whereas at least if you had one insurance company and one hospital, they could play a game of uh, you know, chicken and see who would, you know, who would flinch first. So the idea that what health, what Obamacare did that's really great is create all this competition among insurance companies, it really doesn't make they any sense. They have no power. Because the power in this town, for example, you know where the power is. The power is with you know, partners and the high quality providers that compete with partners. <clears throat> in fact, a lot of people are worried that the partners has too much power. Um, so the notion that, well, well, if only we could get 10 more insurance companies to sell health insurance in Massachusetts, everything would be great. It's just, I mean, I only took Economics 101, but that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I'm glad that you, you went all over through, through that, especially with the charge master. I felt like we needed to cover that. That was almost a public service. People should know about the charge master. Oh, and one other thing the, about it, that, 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 I'm sorry, that's really sort of insipid about it is, <laughs> Um, let's say you're insurance, now across the country insurance companies typically get, not in the case of you know, open heart surgery at New York Presbyterian, which is a big ticket but high specialty item, they typically get a 40% discount off of the charge master, maybe 30%, maybe 50%. So think of how the charge master works for everybody involved except for you, the consumer. You go and you're in the hospital, you know, you're in the emergency room and you know, it's $9,000 later, okay? Like that, you know, the woman I described with the two cat scans. It's $9,000 later, um, and you have pretty good insurance. So your insurance involves a 20% co-insurance. So you see the hospital's bill is $9,000 on the charge master. The insurance company has turned that $9,000, let's say, into $5,000. You're gonna pay 20% of $5,000, right? Because the insurance company pays 80%, you pay 20%. And that's even not a very good policy. So you're gonna pay $1,000. The first thing you look at is you say, oh my God, thank God I had insurance. This I was on the hook for $9,000 and now I only pay $1,000. This is just couldn't be better. You know, oh, maybe $1,000 is a lot of money, but not compared to the $9,000 that everybody else would have had to pay. So that's how the charge minister helps yeah. everybody except the consumer. Except the the consumer. insurance company looks great. They got this great discount. You know, getting a discount of you know, 40 or 50% off of a $77 box of gauze pads 
it really isn't that good a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Along with the charge master, the other arresting section I found was your whole discussion of the nonprofit, quotes, hospital. Um, it seems a stupid question, but uh, why are they called nonprofit hospitals when they apparently are raking it in because hand over fist? To, because if, you, if they can call themselves nonprofit hospitals and get a, um, a tax exemption, tax exempt status from the IRS as nonprofits, they don't have to pay taxes. But how can they retain these, this designation if they're in fact making? Because they do God's work. Uh -huh. and, that, and that is that is facetious and serious at the same time. You were very hard on the little Sisters of Mercy in your book. Yeah, I because remember. you just got to love the name and you yeah. see the, one of the Sisters of you Mercy the, on the, the annual report. You said the mission was to carry out the healing ministry of Jesus. And then you cited the, the CEO's salary. Well, I see the CEO's said Plus, they employ a battalion of collection firms and lawyers all across the Midwest suing people into bankruptcy. Um, it's just true. I mean, you know, it, it's not often as a journalist you get a story like that, and they're called the Sisters of Mercy. I'll give you that. <laughs> but, you know, but, that, but that's what nonprofit status is. And you know, to be serious about it for a minute, let's step back and remember something. Uh, the people who work at these hospitals, the people who run these hospitals, um, you know, it's not like they wake up in the morning and they go produce you know, violent you know, games for teenagers or porn or something. I mean, they are curing the mm -hmm. sick. And they think of themselves that way, rightly so. And if you're the CEO of a big hospital, you think of yourself as someone who is organizing in terms of the financial power and prowess and the talent and the, everything it takes to make this hospital work so that it takes care of the sick. It is, that is true. It's just that um, in most situations I've found, and this is, the education I got when I started writing about lawyers, for God's sake, um, is that when people have a lot of unchecked power, um, they tend, even the best people, tend to abuse it. And here, again, you have patients who will pay anything. You know, They're puddles like you were. You know, <laughs> bear any burden, yeah. pay any price. Yeah. Um, who will uh, do anything when they're yeah. sick or when their loved one is sick. and. Um, Everybody in the business knows it. And so, you know, they're nonprofits, you know, and the politics of it is in every town, in every city, they're often the biggest business or one of the biggest businesses. They have the, the most highly compensated. They have a great the image in the community, too, usually. But they're the local charity. You know, Greenwich Hospital, owned by Yale New Haven, where the president of Greenwich Hospital makes $33 for every night a patient stays in a bed in Greenwich Hospital. I mean, just think if, if you were the Marriott's and you could do that. Um, <laughs> uh, he makes more. Greenwich Hospital is owned by Yale New Haven. Greenwich Hospital is kind of like the size of this room. Um, he makes more than the president of Yale University. Greenwich Hospital. They have an annual charity. Say dinner. that again? He makes more than the president of Yale University. Now, his boss, the president of the Yale healthcare system, makes a lot more, I mean, just a lot more. But, um, I mean, that's, that's the alternate universe that is the healthcare universe. Is there no validity to the hospital's points that, you know, they've got, it's not cheap to run a hospital. I mean, they, they've got to uh, spend a lot of money on technology. They've got to comply with thousands of government regulations. They, they need, upon occasion, to build new facilities, to be competitive, et cetera. Totally true. So, and when they get finished doing that, they have an average operating profit margin of 12.7%. When they get finished doing all that good stuff. These are, you were talking profit hospitals non or non-profit? Non -profit? No, we're the, just talking non -profit. the for-profit actually are slightly less profitable. <laughs> the, this wait is healthcare. Just, the for-profit you know, hospitals, they make yeah. less money than the yeah, non-profits? When, when you factor in the taxes they have to pay, they, they, are, they are not as good a business as, as the non-profits. So, I mean, I was on this, this panel or, or in discussion um, with Zeke Emanuel, mm -hmm. um, who is huh. a lot less insightful and well-mannered than you are. But then again, with Zeke, that's not a high bar. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, so Zeke, so um, I'm talking about uh, one of my favorite hospitals, favorite hospital stories, is Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. And it was one of those sort of 
aha moments. I'm thinking about Montefiore Hospital, and I, and I get up, and I go, and I do this research, and I find out that Montefiore Hospital is a much better business and a bigger business than the other great than the other great business in the Bronx, my New York Yankees. <laughs> Big, now, some of the Yankee salaries are higher, I admit that, okay? But in terms of revenue, profit, Montefiore just smothers the Yankees. You're so, talking about compensation for executives? What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, compensation for executives, but profit, bottom line profit, uh, much more profit. You would rather own Montefiore Hospital than the New York Yankees in a flash, okay? So I'm talking about all this, I'm on this panel, and, and Zeke Emanuel says, well, you don't understand, they have um, these vans that go around all over the Bronx and do tests for you know, tuberculosis and do tests for cancer, they have this clinic, they have that clinic, they have this dental clinic. By the way, the head of the dental department at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx makes $2 million a year. Anyway, so they, have, so they have all this stuff that they do, and they do. It's a great hospital. They do great stuff. Yeah. And I said, yeah, but see, when they get finished doing all that and spending all that money on research and on care and on vans, you know, going through the South mm -hmm. Bronx, that's when they, and after that, they ended up with $197 million in operating profit. So why can't they lower their prices? It's after they do all that good stuff. So it's a, it's a mixed thing. I mean, the, again, these are, these are all good people. They're, you know, they're doing, you know, it's hard to get uh, too, you know, accusatory of, of people who are, you know, you're getting up in the morning and going up to the Bronx and making people better who are sick. But it's the economic um, infrastructure and structure and expectation uh, that, that that really, I think, undermines that long term, but and certainly undermines the country. But you're not talking about the doctors themselves, right? No, no, no. no. no so no. how are the how are the doctors? I mean, talk about the people who are you know doing the Lord's work, if you will. These are the people who are actually treating patients. Doctors, how have they fared under Obamacare? Uh, they are probably hurt a little bit because they they have um, their their payments, for example, for Medicaid are coming down uh, instead of. So they're not in the millions of dollars yeah, now, now competing they're, they're, with the CEO. There are a lot of doctors that make money, you know, good money. You know, some of them game the system by you know, investing in clinics where they send all their blood tests and stuff like that, or labs where they send all the blood tests. You know, some of them game the system. Some of them you know, commit absolute you know, Medicare fraud. But by and large, doctors and nurses have not ridden uh, the gravy train. Now, if they had, now, you, you know, I'm sure my heart surgeon, in fact, I tried to figure this out using my old skills from uh, when I ran the American Lawyer, when I used to be able to figure out anybody's salary, um, how much money my surgeon made. Now, this, is, this guy is like the 99th percentile open heart surgeon in New York. So, um, and I, I don't know, I came out somewhere uh, high six figures, maybe seven figures. Why didn't you just ask him? Well, I could have, but he would have said, I did, and he said no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, of all the things that would bother me in the world, I mean, my list of things I'd want to fix in healthcare, the idea that, you know, when I'm looking up at the gurney at him, that he's making as much, maybe, as, you know, a junior partner or senior associate doing debentures at a Wall Street law firm, that's really not high on my list that's of okay. things yeah. uh, that bother me. And the idea that if you're really a star MRI, a CAT scan salesman in New England, you probably make more money than him. That bothers me a little more. Yeah. Um, this is great. I know that there's, you folks probably have some questions. There are microphones out there somewhere. I'm not sure I can see them. Uh, let's see, where are they? Anyway, uh, we're, we're happy to take questions. Steve is happy to take questions, so step right up to the microphone. And maybe you can figure out why gauze pads cost $77. <laughs> These lights are really bright. It's These lights are so bright. It's new meaning to, to the notion of uh, Miranda rights. When you <laughs> lights here like this. It's better than having that bare light bulb above your head <laughs> right. while they ask the question. Exactly. Well, I won't give you too much of a uh, tough question then if the lights are uh, a challenge. No, no. That's, that's but uh, so I love the discussion very complicated subject, you reduce it to a way I think we can all understand. 
this access cost, ACA, high marks for access, low marks for cost. Given the reality of the stress public treasuries are under with paying for not only this but other things, how does the cost discussion ever come back into the public debate? I, I get asked that question now since the book has come out at least once or twice a day, so you would have thought I would have a halfway articulate answer, um, which I really don't. Um, it, it, I mean, I, I actually have kind of a pathetic answer, which is like the, the only way I can see it, now I make some proposals for how you can do reform in the book, but the only way I think there's gonna be a real movement for reform is if there's a, if there's a fiscal crisis, if this really starts to hit us over the head. Uh, you know, yesterday, um, a bridge collapsed in Ohio, right? Um, a bridge outside Cincinnati. So we've had this long you know, discussion for two or three years about infrastructure. We have to invest in our infrastructure. Infrastructure is a huge problem in America. It's sort of like the climate change discussion. It's a huge growing problem, but those are slow developing problems. Now, if God forbid 10 bridges had collapsed yesterday, we would be doing infrastructure today, right? A bill would sail through Congress. Probably. So the problem with, with, with health care that I'm describing is it's this slow, not so slow, but pretty slow moving uh, crisis. It's a crisis in every family's pocketbook as deductibles and coinsurance keeps going up, and it's a crisis for the government. And I don't know when that moment is going to be um, or when we're going to have the political leadership that's going to say, this is a really big deal and we have to deal with it. It's hard, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> I purchased your book on Saturday and I'm a slow reader, so <laughs> I haven't gotten through much of it. No, but the, it's, the it's, most important thing was the purchase. <laughs> I only got a 30% discount. I didn't wait for it to be on the best seller list. Uh, but um, in the reading I did of it, uh, I have three really three subjects I'd like to at least briefly mention. In all your discussions and interviews, did the subject, and I, by the way, I'm a retired professional cost accountant. Uh, in all your discussions with people, did the subject in our annual expenditures for medical care, how much of that percentage-wise goes to the last year of life? It, it comes up a lot, and it is true, but I, I sort of have a different, re I mean, and that is a problem, and, and we have to sort of deal with it and face it, but I have a different reaction to that. Um, one of the reasons I got interested in this was during the time Obamacare was being debated, the debate was, first of all, about how do we pay the exorbitant cost of health care, not why is it so exorbitant. And second, at the time, there were a couple of long magazine articles, even a book written by people whose loved ones had been terminally ill and they had to face that choice of, you know, do I spend a million dollars to keep my loved one I'm alive for six months or $300,000 or a million dollars for a year? And these wrenching, agonizing decisions. Now, maybe it's the fact that I've been an entrepreneur most of my life and been in business. When I would read that, I would say to myself, well, why does it cost a million dollars? Who's getting that money? So, yes, it's a big problem, but the, way, the first way I would look at the problem before you get into sort of the really tough philosophical and ethical questions about that is, why does it cost so much money? Why is a, you know, a cancer drug that maybe will keep someone alive for three months, uh, why is it $90,000 instead of $10,000 or $2,000? How come? A professional cost accountant could answer that question. <laughs> uh, two, uh, I am the beneficiary of our very poor mental health system. And looking through your book, I was looking to see whether uh, you had anything to say about our mental health system in this book. Not in particular, though. I'm really curious what it means to be the beneficiary of a poor <laughs> mental health system. <laughs> Well, Should I be worried about you? <laughs> Some people were. There is a stigma associated with it, including my former wife. 
Okay. We're into a different subject. Yeah. We should probably okay. move on to number yeah. three. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. <laughs> Question three. It's got to be two. better than two. Les, we're, we've now provided insurance for a lot of people who are not insured. Is there any concern of where we're going to get the professionals, doctors, nurses, and other oh, yeah. health care professionals well, to provide a, services to all these additional beneficiaries? There, there is a lot of concern. I haven't done enough reporting to know exactly how This should be your next solid. book. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I hear different things. For example, I do hear, and it's convincing, that with efficiencies in technology, um, uh, doctors and their practices can be made more efficient that if, uh, if nurses and, you know, and other you know, people just below doctors in the chain could be allowed more responsibility, things could be more efficient. I mean, for example, um, it's insane that uh, there isn't a billing category in Medicare for telemedicine. So a doctor who's gonna spend 20 minutes on the phone uh, with a Medicare patient gets zero. And if he has the patient come into his office or her office and spend 20 minutes, we'll get uh, you know 50 or 100 or 150 dollars. That just there's no sense in that. Um, I'm told that we have only about 15 minutes left, so we need to move on with okay. the questions. And if you can um, state them fairly briefly, we'll only I, take a few I, I, I may have used up your whole budget on back pain uh, over <laughs> the years, and I've got no success anyway. That's not what, what my question is. I was fascinated reading uh, the Time Magazine article. Uh, about what your solutions uh, could be, and particularly in, in terms of uh, a business that wipes out the need for insurance companies. Could you elaborate sure. on that somewhat? Sure, let me try that in a couple of minutes. Um, in the course of doing the book, um, I came across a couple of um, doctor leaders of major healthcare institutions, such as Dr. Gottlieb here, um, and Toby Cosgrove in uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and there's a lot of concern that these systems are expanding, gobbling up market share, um, uh, which I share. But then I started to think about it and looked at some of the models around the country. <coughs> For example, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which is, you know, humongous, occupies the, the penthouse suites of the U.S. Steel Building. They've taken over the U.S. Steel Building, that tells you something. Um, they are now their own insurance company, so they have a dominant share of the insurance market and a stranglehold on the provider market of hospitals and doctors and clinics in uh, western Pennsylvania. Now that's a terrible thing unregulated, but it struck me that what you could do is have a bunch of regulations and acknowledge these oligopolies as the oligopolies that they are, or in some cases, as in Pittsburgh, the monopolies. This is sort of the Kaiser Permanente model. Yeah, exactly. Way, except it's a different the... notion of market share mm -hmm. than uh, than Kaiser has. A different notion of, of sweep. It's something that uh, that people here in Boston can understand. Because they have at the partners. they have their their interests are the same. Right. They're both trying so to keep. So if I buy insurance, so let's take Cleveland or Yale New Haven, we two dominant uh, uh, markets. I would rather buy my insurance, well, uh, uh, let's take, uh, you know, partners. Before he left, I would rather give Gary Gottlieb $10,000 if I lived in Boston and say, you've got all these doctors, you've got all these hospitals, here's $10,000, that's my health insurance, you keep me healthy. <laughs> um, I'd want to regulate what he can do, I'd want to have ombudsman to make sure he doesn't skimp on care. But, you know, I think a, a guy like Gottlieb who went into medicine to you know, be a as I understand it, a psychiatrist for you know for you know, for elderly patients. Um, I'd rather have him in charge than an insurance company. You know. Let's see if we have a couple more questions. But with tough, tough Excuse regulation of pricing and profits and everything else, but sort of take advantage of the expansionism of these places if they're providing good care and really regulate them. And then when you cut out the insurance company. What you're cutting out is all the, right now, a hospital and doctor have an incentive to bill because the insurance company's got to pay it. But if the insurance company is the hospital, then, you know, they have no incentive to bill themselves. Time for two more short questions. 
Over here. Yeah, I'm Dr. Phil Caper. I was the first physician Senator Ted Kennedy hired when he became chairman of the Health Subcommittee ah, in 1971. You didn't tell me there's going to be someone in the room who knows something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I've read, I haven't yet read your book, although I certainly will, but I have read all 28,000 words of your Time Magazine cover story, <laughs> and um, you say a lot of good things about Medicare, and you have in right. various interviews you've given subsequently, uh, you point out that it is uh, more efficient than the private insurance uh, pools we have now, that they're more effective in holding prices down for the most part and arguably a more fair system. Uh, but in the litany of suggestions you offer to take care of these multiple problems, you never quite go the whole way and say, why don't we just expand Medicare to cover everybody? Well, I mean, that's I not, that incidentally is not incons inconsistent with your idea of, of basically these no, not, not HMOs at all. I mean, or ACOs? Very simple answer, which is, uh, I think, well, it's actually the same answer that Senator Kennedy gave um, when he was asked about why isn't there um, a public option in Obamacare. It's just not realistic to have one. If you made me, you know, if I could wish, I'd wish it were Christmas today, and I'd also wish that the War Labor Board hadn't done what it had done. But today, it's just not politically realistic. I mean, I think the closest thing to something that might be realistic that way, if you did it gradually, rather than just annihilate the entire health insurance industry in the country, would be to say, um, every year, let's lower the age of Medicare eligibility by one year. So within 40 years, we'd be down to 25 years old. Every Until everybody's Medicare. covered. Yeah, until everybody's covered. Well, okay. my, my, we point is, my point is that but, but you're a very influential guy. And politics are vol volatile. And public opinion matters in these issues. And I think if you would begin speaking out, and people, journalists like you, speaking out in favor of what you think is a really effective uh, solution, that may actually affect the outcome. And I, you know, I hope you consider doing that, because that's really well, the right thing you. to do. Uh, I, I just will say that I... I, mean, I think I've met most of that obligation by presenting the facts, as you just stated, in that article so other people can see it. But I've never considered my role as a journalist to be an advocate for you know, this political position or that one. Let's have Go just one more. Can we just have one more question, please? In your book, you talk about um, the difficulty of developing the Obamacare regulations. And then at the end, you conclude with letting the foxes run the hen house and advocating for a highly regulated um, oligopolies, local mm -hmm. oligopolies. Can you talk about the political viability of well, regulating those oligopolies? Well, I don't think it's inconsistent. I mean, the, the Obama administration, people in charge of doing the regulations, were just incompetent. I, mean, I could have written, a, I think I could have written those hospital regulations. I mean, I've said as a figure of speech in an hour, but it might have taken me a week. But I could have written the regulations controlling the debt collection activities of hospitals very quickly. That it took them five years is just beyond belief. Um, those, you could have had people not being driven into bankruptcy by hospitals the day after Obamacare was signed in 2010. So having said that, I don't think that's, it, it's inconsistent to say if you got some really good regulators, not me, but really good, smart regulators overseeing um, health care, if you had a Federal Trade Commission that, uh, I mean, you know, the Federal Trade Commission ha has allowed Yale New Haven Hospital, I mean, in a way that stupefies any lawyer you talk to, almost, I think, that to control health care in New Haven, and that's happening in communities all over the country. Um, I think you can regulate that. Uh, and in fact, I don't even think you need new law to regulate that. I don't think you've got to worry about what John Boehner thinks of that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all fun. very much. Uh, one announcement. I mean, the, obviously, 
this discussion is, is just getting started, and the material in this book is uh, a perfect jumping off point for all of the well, thank you. outrage thank that you these newly coming. insured people are supposedly going to feel. I think they will. Um, I, I, I want to yes. thank you both for an enlightening forum, but I have one last question oh. for both of you. It's oh. a new tradition that we started oh. here in the forum, which is just to ask each of you for one minute to reflect, if you would, on President Kennedy's legacy and what it means to you personally or in your work? Hmm. Fun to put journalists on the spot. Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that in a minute. You, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, oh, that's I have, true. You go for I have a very personal story that's going to take more than a minute. Could take 90 seconds. Uh, I think, it, I don't think there's one specific thing. I think it's more that whenever I think back to President Kennedy, I just think of an, of an era of idealism. Maybe it has something to do with my age. Uh, the time uh, that, uh, that he was killed, I was in high school. Um, and, uh, you know, you always wonder what would have happened if. Um, so it, it's more, uh, for me, that time is, and I think for everybody of, of a certain age, that time is just preserved. And uh, that's, it's, it's kind of a little secret spot that's a, kind of inspirational, you know? There's nothing specific that I can point to, um, but uh, that, that's kind of how I view it. Well, I was um, a junior high school student um, the day he was shot. Um, and about three weeks later, I, I, I was playing basketball, and I had an accident and broke my knee, so why is this relevant? Um, because in those days, if you went to a New York City public school and you had any injury, they wouldn't let you back into the school like for months. So I was home for two months and I had worshipped Kennedy. I read everything about him and now I just read everything. And that extended uh, a year later, I think it couldn't have been more than a year, maybe a year and a half, when Arthur Schlesinger's book, which I think was the first one that came out. And I was reading it and I read that he went to this thing called Chote which was a prep school. And I asked my parents, I said, what's that? And my parents really didn't know what a prep school was. We didn't have a lot of money. But my mother said, I think it's like college, except it's like you go in high school. And that sounded like a great idea. It was a great idea. Um, and I ended up applying to prep schools as a scholarship student. Um, and I went to Deerfield, which is a little bit to the west here. Um, and that really changed my life, and it was really because I was trying to mimic John Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you both so much. <laughs>